Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. Today it's my pleasure to welcome Robert Brink. Robert has had a long career in skateboarding as a writer and as a e-commerce marketer. Uh, he's going to share a lot of behind the scenes of one of my favorite brands in skateboarding, Primitive Skateboards, um, how they used a digital first mindset to disrupt the industry and help to solve a lot of challenges. And he's going to talk about the influence of skateboarding in broader culture. Let's talk to Robert. Drop in the untold stories of industry leaders, influencers, and insights on future innovation. I'm John Davidson, and this is the DLC, DLC Drop, Drop Podcast. Podcast. All right. Welcome to another episode of the DLC Drop Podcast. It is my pleasure to welcome Robert Brink. Robert is someone I'm really excited to have on the show. Uh, a lot of people who listen to the podcast know my roots are in skateboarding. And so a lot of the uh, specific insights I have in marketing and esports come from the skateboarding world. And Robert, I've seen a lot of your content. I want to say 10, 12 years now from Weekend Buzz to reading your articles. And it's just super cool to have you on the show today. Thank you. So Thanks to start, for reading and watching <laughs> all these years. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I know you've been putting out great content for a long time. And so you've been somebody who's really inspirational to me uh, as someone uh, who uh, wants to do work in this space. Um, why don't you share for our audience first to start out, um, tell us what you're doing today in your career, uh, both whether that's in skateboarding mm -hmm. or outside of it. Um. I guess the easiest way to put it is I always tell people I have two or three jobs. Like I've been a writer, uh, if you want to say professionally, meaning I've been published since 2000. Mm. So, uh, 22 years of professional writing. Wow. Um, but that's always been my side job because writing isn't uh, always lucrative, you know? Yeah. Um, so I've always written for magazines and then when magazines slowed down websites and yeah, everything from trans world and the skateboard mag to ESPN and playboy, uh, you know, um, you know, that sort of led to the podcast or talk show. I don't know what to call it these days. Uh, weekend buzz. Yeah. Um, you know, um, just, I guess I sort of became a voice and, and maybe if for lack of a better term, a personality as a writer. And then as video content became more prominent, I started popping up there and, and the ride channel when they were forming wanted some content. So I pitched weekend buzz, you know, or we came, I should, I, I misspoke. We came up together with the concept for Weekend Buzz. Yeah. And they thought I would be a good person to have a show. And that lasted five years. Um, but alongside that stuff, I've always maintained jobs within the skate industry to help pay the bills. And those jobs have usually been in the realm of digital marketing, social media, email marketing, content marketing, um, and then over time, I learned more and more, learned e-commerce, um, you know, so a lot of my focus these days is digital marketing, e-commerce, um, you know, when I help out skate brands and stuff. So, yeah. Now, have you always wanted to work in skateboarding from a young age or is that something that at a certain point in your life you saw was a possibility and you just went down that path? Mm. I mean, I guess once I became really serious about skateboarding in, you know, in my teens, yeah. back then I, I never ever thought I wanted to be a pro skater. I just knew I wasn't good enough. Yeah. Like I never had that delusion it, for me. It was, it would have been a delusion. Um, <laughs> it was a delusion for some, me for a short time. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to say it's a delusion because it's possible for anyone, I think. But, uh, yeah, it wasn't until college where I was like, you know, starting to think about a career mm -hmm. and working at a skate shop and sort of making connections, you know, cause when you're all the way on the East coast in Jersey, where I grew up, like, especially in the nineties, like California just seems so far away. Like it seems unattainable, you know? 
right? Yeah. You, you can't even save up for a flight when you're that age, you know? Yeah. So it's like, uh, I guess it started seeming more and more possible as some of my closer friends got sponsored by West Coast companies and Tim O'Connor, Poncho Moeller. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was a photographer friend of mine named Ryan G on the East Coast. Yeah. Um, he started getting photos published. There was a New York boom in the mid 90s. And I was like, OK, this is possible. But, you know, I also hadn't nailed down my major in college as a writer yet. Mm. Um, so it all sort of started coming together as like, I was like, well, Ryan G's a photographer. Maybe I could be a writer from the East coast, you know? And yeah. Tim O'Connor went, Tim O'Connor went pro and was like the biggest thing for a while. And he connected me with everybody. And that combined with the fact that probably that I had like a master's degree in writing and experience at a skate shop. And I was just really passionate, uh, all of that combined, I think, was sort of the perfect storm. And I started getting job offers and writing for mags and stuff. That's awesome. That so, all kind of stuff that all kind of started in like 2001 from the East Coast. And okay. by 2004, I was in California with a job. The DLC Drop podcast is sponsored by Ice Shaker. I've been a huge fan of this brand for the past few years, ever since I met founder Chris Gronkowski. Uh, what I love about this product is the brand story, the functionality, and the customization. iShaker is a Shark Tank company invested in by Mark Cuban and Alex Rodriguez, owned by NFL players Rob Gronkowski and Chris Gronkowski. I love using my iShaker anytime I'm driving to the podcast studio, I'm going skateboarding, or I'm at the gym. No matter what I'm doing, it just does a great job of keeping my drinks hot or cold. The customization for Ice Shaker is something that's super unique. You can get any name, just about any logo engraved onto your Ice Shaker and delivered to you within just three to five business days. Get your own DLC Drop branded Ice Shaker at icesaker.com forward slash DLC Drop. Save 20% on all Ice Shaker products with the discount code DLC Drop. Yeah, so to give the non skaters in the audience an idea of kind of that dynamic is back in the day, everything's happening in Southern California, some Northern mm -hmm. California too, in the San Francisco area. But uh, pre Instagram, pre anywhere on the globe, you just throw it online and people see your clips. Like, yeah, if, if, if you weren't in California, uh, it, it must have felt millions of miles away is for how can I mm -hmm. even do this for a living? Yeah. And social media was the great sort of equalizer in all of that. Um, the world definitely, the skate world definitely started feeling smaller when, and more attainable when social media became a thing, which, which is great. And what was that first opportunity to get to work directly in the skateboarding industry in California on the West coast? Um, well, the first real opportunities was writing for Transworld. And then I was writing, they had multiple magazines at the time. I was writing for more than one of them. They had the business magazine, the skate mag, and they had Transworld Stance, which was kind of like a culture lifestyle magazine. And, uh, and that one was cool because I was interviewing like celebrities, not just skaters. I've never been one to shy away from the outside world, you know, sure. uh, beyond skateboarding. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that led to um, Skin Phillips passing my name around, and and uh, DC hired me. They needed a copywriter, and they actually moved me to California, and uh, it was pretty awesome. I mean, it's just being able to get out there with a job instead of coming out there <laughs> and like slumming it and job hunting, you know? Yeah. I've always been very calculated with major life decisions. Like, if anything, I'm overly cautious and wait maybe sometimes too long. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would have never gone out there without a job. Like that would have been too scary for me personally. Some people could just go for it. And I really admire that. Uh, but I, I, I'm not like that. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know that you ever make a good decision when you're desperate, 
And so <laughs> I always use the example of yeah. going to the car lot. If you need a car that day, um, you're probably going to get screwed. But if you go to the car lot, especially on the last day of the month when that uh, salesperson <laughs> is incentivized to sell a car that day and you don't need one, um, you're probably going to get the, the yeah. greatest deal of all time, right? And that can be applied Leverage. to other aspects of our life. Yeah. Yeah, totally. One thing that I really love about your story and your career is that you've done so much in skateboarding off the board that's enabled you to do a lot of super cool stuff in skateboarding. And while I haven't um, had the same career that you have, I've I've been able to skate street league skate courses. I've been featured on the oh, barracks. Cool. I've been able to do some pretty cool, unique things that, yeah, I can skate, but I'm not Shane O'Neill. I'm not Nyjah. I'm not... I would never be in these situations like a street league course if it wasn't for the stuff I was doing off the board that was connected to that contest. Can you speak a little bit about how your skill and your expertise and your master's degree in writing has enabled you to skate in Barcelona, you know, travel the world and do all these other things that you wouldn't if you were just trying to be a sponsored or a pro skater? Yeah. Um, I think what's interesting is when I was getting all this, like when I was trying to begin my career in the late nineties, um, it didn't seem like there was a lot of room for that. Right. It was like, you were either like a pro or an am or whatever, or you were like, I mean, you got to also consider how much smaller the industry was and skateboarding was back then. Sure. There was a finite space, you know? So it was like, I didn't even know being a writer could work, you know? Yeah. So, but you're asking me sort of like how I think I just, I was less shy than I am now. Mm. I, I was less introverted. I asked for help. I asked people for opportunities. I guess I had the credentials compared to a lot of other people in skateboarding. Like, mm -hmm. oh, this guy's like finishing his masters, you know? Yeah. Um, and I just figured there had to be a way to get in. Like, <laughs> mm. it, it, even if you're not a, I mean, I grew up like worshiping, <clears throat> reading Big Brother, and I saw there was all these people in there that, like I said, like you said, they weren't pro skaters. They were like characters, you know? Yeah. And they highlighted the staff, unlike the other magazines. Right. The staff became the cast. Yeah. And I was like, you know, not that I necessarily wanted to, I mean, I would have loved to have read for Big Brother, but I wasn't trying to be part of Big Brother, but I was like, oh, there's room for other people, you know? It opened your um, mind up to the possibility. Yeah. And, and I don't mean to be long-winded about this question, but yeah. And then the next thing you know, you're like writing for a magazine and you meet this person and then they invite you to this event. Or I was working at a shop and Xavier Shoes launched and they invited me to a sort of a focus group out in Portland. And then I met yeah. a bunch of people there that I'm still friends with. And that was in the late nineties. Like I'm still friends with all those guys, like Brian Anderson and Hunter from Nike. And you know, it's crazy. And it's like, I guess, I guess when you're in the industry too, you're not just skating, you know? Right. You're doing, you say so you're doing other things and, and you, but yeah, it's, I, I don't know how it happens. Like it just snowballs, you know? Mm -hmm. I think it comes <laughs> and, down and to relationships. Was, yeah. And you know, I, I always say this, I, I go to bed probably a couple of nights a month wishing I was more outgoing and more social. And, and, and if I was better at networking and I don't, I don't mean this in a bad way, I'm just not a social butterfly. My mm -hmm. career would be, my career would be so different and my experiences would be even more vast than you might think they are. Uh, if I was better at being social mm -hmm. and, uh, more talkative and, and things like that. And, um, so as much as I've done, which has been amazing and has been a ton of stuff, um, I'm one of the least, <laughs> I'm like one of the least social people I know. And it's not that, uh, it's not in an arrogant way or an angry way. 
it's yeah. just in a way that um relates to my sort of uh i guess what mental and emotional well-being and you know my mental health and stuff and it, it's just me it, it has nothing to do with other people uh i i go to a video premiere uh-huh. and i am like the first one out the door like i and then i get home and i'm like man i i should have talked to people and <laughs> you know yeah but, uh i miss those people i wish i said hi it, it, but yeah i my career would be very different if i was better at socializing and networking to your to your point about meeting yeah. people and stuff well it's a, i mean transparently it's a little surprising to hear you say that uh especially uh <clears throat> someone who has hosted you know the weekend buzz show you know for five years what was yeah. that like not being a super social person and stepping into that role um without getting into like a huge discussion because our time's limited about um you know like my my neurodivergence and uh autism and things like that uh i'm in my zone when i'm interviewing you know mm. Um, interviewing is what I like to do. Uh, you know, when the cameras are over here, not here <laughs> Yeah, and, like... and my guests are here. Yeah. Like I just, all I've ever wanted to do is bring cool conversations that I've experienced, uh, like having lunch with a pro skater or, or in the van with pro skaters, like those moments I've had one-on-one -on -one with skaters over the years. Mm-hmm that weren't that weren't interviews that they weren't public it's just right. me hanging out with sean malto having sushi in 2009 right like yeah while he was in town like those moments that aren't marketing they're not scripted i'm like how do i bring this feeling of this amazing evening and conversation with this pro skater uh, that when I was a little kid, I'd be tripping right now. The little me would be tripping and I'm For hanging sure. out with like pro skaters. Like, how do I bring this moment to all the other skaters of the world? Right. So, yeah. And this, this conversation over coffee that I'm having with Danny Garcia or, uh, you know, any, anyone I've hung out with over the years, you know, yeah. how do I bring this conversation to all the other skate nerds out there? So it's just a lot easier for me to be in my zone doing um, one of the things I feel I'm best at mm -hmm. interviewing. Um, it's way more intimate and personal than, you know, going to a video premiere or speaking on stage publicly or <laughs> walking along the street league course with, with, a, with a cup of tea to get my seat while everybody's looking at me, you know, like, <laughs> like that, yeah. that stuff's like a nightmare to me. Uh, it, but it, I, I do understand how it seems very almost contradictory to people that I could sit there and do weekend buzz for three, four hours at a time for five years every week. Yeah. But still be like on the spectrum or super introverted or whatever. I, I get it. Um, that's the best I can explain it. I'm just, that's my that's my wheelhouse is yeah. interviewing you know and when i don't see the cameras and i get going with a skater or a guest um it's fine i, I don't even think about it that's cool what it's is, the intimacy of it you know yeah what has been your uh your biggest fan out moment or maybe your favorite mm -hmm. interview that you've done with somebody whether it's been on camera or or just privately um you know, Lee, Lee and Erica, both, both of my weekend buzz co-hosts, they would know when I was really fanning out and, and <laughs> um, I, I guess there was maybe something different about me, but when those guys who I watched a billion times on VHS in the early nineties came on the show, mm -hmm. Guy Mariano, Jeremy Ray, uh, Mike Carroll, you know, also guests I never even knew would be interested in coming on. Sure. You know, people like that, you know, I never in a million years expected Guy Marano on my show. Yeah. Cause like he was kind of gone and then 
you know, and then fully, uh, well, yeah, fully flared happened. And then he came back and it was like, who knows if he's going to be like low key, like he used to be or more outgoing, you know, mm -hmm. um, moments like that were, were crazy. Like I, I, I remember like I had a different feeling in me while doing those interviews, Chris Markovich, yeah. um, just, he's someone I idolized when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Um, like just how fast he skated and how cool he looked. And when all those guys were on the show, the early nineties guys and, and they're older now and they're able to talk about things they weren't supposed to talk about back in the day. Right. And, and they're being more candid, you know, you can go back and be like, I heard this rumor from 1994. Is that true? You know what I mean? Like when you can do that with those guys and even Jeff Grosso, like I wasn't a Jeff Grosso necessarily a fan sure just because i'm a street skater and i was never you know watching bowl skating and park skating wasn't necessarily my thing you know right um but just sitting there having a conversation with somebody who's been in the game so long and has so much experience is you know sometimes i become a fan during throughout the course of the interview sure that makes like, sense like a real fan like i love that guy like i respected grosso and i know he rips and i know his personality is awesome but i didn't know like how much i would relate to him or you know and i i connect with people that way and end up feeling very different once they leave yeah i've heard it said once so, before something like it's hard to hate on someone once you know their story because even if you don't <clears throat> agree with them on everything um, you, you know, like what shaped them and what they came through. And, um, you know, a lot of people have come through a lot of things, you know, when you can respect and relate to someone's story and say, oh, wow, I wasn't the yeah. biggest fan of you before this, but I didn't know all of these other things that impacted who you are, or, or I didn't have that context from your perspective to explain the thing that I took out of context when you meant it this way instead of that way. I've always found that pretty fascinating. Yeah. Um, and to, I think my, I don't disagree with you. I think you're right. Um, my experience is a little different in the sense that I don't necessarily relate to people's struggles or need them to explain or, or peel back layers, uh, to, to, overcome those like maybe negative feelings I might have had or thought about them, misconceptions, whatever. Yeah. For me, it's just about the connection, mm. right? Like there could be someone who has had no struggles at all or doesn't, I don't relate to at all. But if we have that connection of like, this dude's cool or this woman's cool, they're respectful. We had a really good rapport. Like I, they resonate with me. I connect with them. Like, right. Um, that's what it really is for me is like, oh, that was an effortless conversation. Yeah. It was genuine, you know, um, that's how I feel. And, you know, I've actually been thinking about that a lot lately because I'm working on a book, um, a, 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 mi a mini memoir and there's people in my past who were really good to me who I care very deeply about impacted my life in amazing ways. Mm -hmm. But on paper, especially in 2022, they're awful people. Oh, they wow. Were they were racists. Oh, they wow. were homophobes. They were abusers. And it's like, I don't agree with that. Right. Mm -hmm. But these people also looked after me when I had some hard times with my family as they taught me everything I know about life. Um, yeah. So I'm struggling a little bit with like, you know, can you can still have that connection? <laughs> can a person still be good for you if they are a racist? <laughs> like, I don't agree. Yeah. I'm not a racist. Right. But you also took care of me protected mm -hmm. me when I was having trouble with my family. You were good to me. Right. So yeah, it, it's an interesting thing where, where I find the connection <laughs> is 
I, I don't know how, how to call it other than like some sort of connection that you have with people, you know? Um, yeah. And or maybe, and even though you disagree on some things, mm-hmm. <laughs> gun control, uh, right. COVID masks, uh, whatever you might disagree on, can there still be a connection that's positive and beneficial to each of you? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's something I'm grappling with as I start to tell this story is like, um, you know what I'm saying? I do. I think it's really interesting to think about separating the complex pieces of a person, right? And there's pieces that you're going to have overlap and alignment with, and there's going to be pieces that you don't. And which ones have the higher priority or, or are most meaningful, right? Because there's all sorts yeah. of things that you might have in common and in contrast with a person that either that brings you closer together and you're saying, hey, I'm willing to either overlook these things or, or to not focus on them as much. Or there may be things that say, no, because of those things, I, I cannot um, embrace the similarities as much. And that's a really, yeah, that is a lot to grapple with and to, to think through. Yeah, and, and thank God it's a memoir and it's my story. And I think I have a way to present it properly but it's still a struggle to think about and um like i said for me it's not for me to go back to your original question i just think it's about the connection and the actual in the moment feeling that happens Mm -hmm. um you know not so much of like uncovering like oh this guy's like me like i don't need someone to be like me i don't need to have things in common I just need to be able to sit there and effortlessly hang out and talk to somebody. Yeah. And f- feel safe or comfortable, whatever the word is, you know? Mm-hmm. I feel that. I do, I do want to bring up a mm-hmm. um, experience in your career that I'm super excited about, which is primitive sure. skateboarding. Okay. Yeah. And part of why is I actually grew up with Paul Rodriguez cousins um oh, george cool. and sam in central california they lived in a small town mm-hmm. called orange cove i lived in reedley california outside of fresno mm-hmm. and so every once in a while paul would come in and this was during his it was a right before he got on girl and then right when he got on in fact uh, i was at george and sam's house one day and paul calls them and this was when he had uh, left City Stars, and he's trying to figure out what his next move is. And he's like, "Dude, I skated with Mike Carroll today and Costin. Oh wow! And I there, there's this. I can see the spot in my mind. Um, and I think it was in Yeah Right. It was like a a giant five, you know, it's like a huge five. And he frontside flips it, and then I think he switch frontside flipped it as well. And mm. so I'm sitting there. He's on speakerphone, and he's telling these dudes like what he just did and how he's excited about you know figuring out his next move and then another time we took him to a local spot oh my gosh like it was this uh a a truck dock with a gap after it and i used to skate Mm -hmm. it all the time and i was kind of the dude in my town who had done most of the tricks over it and then we oh. took Paul Rodriguez there, and I was no longer the guy who had done most yeah. of it. <laughs> and he probably did it in one session versus your lifetime. Yes. In fact, uh, he did. <laughs> the thing that was so shocking, you know, we all skated together for a moment, and then we all just decided to sit back and witness greatness. And so we're all sitting on the ground. And the thing that tripped me out the most was how slow he skated this gap. Like he was doing like nollie backside flip over it, going slower than I could just propel an ollie over this gap. And the other thing was he was catching all his tricks pretty low, like just kind of floating them down and floating them down. And I was like, oh. this is interesting how he's skating this. And then his last trick, he just pops a kickflip waist high, catching it above the, <laughs> the gap. And it was just like, yeah, oh, I can do this too. And... So I have been a big fan of Paul uh, for a long time. I've I've worn his shoes. Um, I I met him in Portland after he won that that street league, which is really cool, especially with that shoe coming out and all the campaign around it. And I've also mm-hmm. been a big fan of Primitive with how the brand launched and how they've utilized content differently in this mm-hmm. Instagram era. That's the thing that's 
really impressed me most about the brand, but I want to get some of your take on and just your experience of launching that brand and growing it. And then I've got some questions from there. Yeah, I'm glad you noticed that because um, that's something we very purposely tried to do was like, um, how do we how do we leverage the team in a in a in an even more effective way um and empower them more and have them have every member of the team uplift the whole right Mm -hmm. like um but in a digital era kind of way right yeah um but but let me go back but i I am glad you noticed that because that was very intentional you know it was but so when i came to california in 2004 one of the first people i met was heath brinkley he worked at dc he was the tm Oh, okay and i sat like down the hallway from him but he was in the room with like blayback and the filmers and all the pros would hang out in there so i would always sneak from my office and go like hang out in the cool room and yeah, Heath was quiet, and I think I think we connected because we felt like a little bit of outcasts. You know, he was from uh, Tennessee, I believe. I don't know if he came okay there directly, but from Tennessee. Um, and I was from New Jersey, and we were new, and so we would go to lunch together. And then uh, maybe three years later, I was at Etney's, and someone in the company's like, "Hey, we're hiring Heath Brinkley," and I was like, "No way." And uh, they're like, yeah, he's going to bring Malto and Mikey and Tyler oh, to sick. the squad. And yeah. So that was amazing because now I'm at Etnies. We have all these new riders. One of my friends has come in. And that's when I started going on all those trips that you mentioned. Um, you know, that era and that relationship with Heath like took me it's kind of like out of the office and out of contests like local contests and over you know to japan and barcelona yeah um so when heath left soltech to work for paul um i had left soltech and did a brief stint at element and he hit me up and he was like hey uh we're gonna start something paul's gonna leave plan b Mm -hmm. and we're gonna start something and and you know, throughout our friendship and time at Etnies, he always heard me talking about social media and content marketing. Cause I was in the van with those guys and I was filming little clips with yeah. my pocket camera. And I was like, dude, these guys are going to be bigger than the brands and no one's leveraging the power of the pro. And, you mm-hmm. know, and, um, I would just have all these thoughts and what can we do? And, And so thankfully when Heath was starting primitive or, or the year before primitive, he hit me up and he's like, I want you to help us with this. Like, I want to do e-commerce like Mm. in a way that without hesitation, you know, without, you know, fear of that's not what people usually do, you know, (laughs) and I want to figure out ways to, you know, where everyone on the team like promotes one guy on the same day. And then he gets like 30,000 new followers. Like it was like a thing. It, mm. it, it wasn't calculated in a bad way. The whole goal was to uplift everybody, you know? So like right. when we added Bastion to the team, for mm-hmm. example, it was like everyone, this sounds so obvious now, but it wasn't happening back then. Yeah. And this was 2014, 2015, but, mm-hmm. um, everyone on the team on this day is going to just pipe the shit out of Bastion. You know right. what I mean? And then, everyone on the team on this day is going to promote this gold venture collab P rod truck that, you Mm. know, this sounds so obvious right now, but it was not, I promise you it was not happening in 2014. And, you know, even down to things like selling trucks on the website, even though we didn't make them, Mm. we just, Heath wanted me on board. He gave me the freedom and the support to experiment. He trusted me. And that was my involvement in primitive for about 18 months. And even down to the, um, like the subscription boxes they did. I don't know if they still do that program. I don't know if they do either, but I thought that was super smart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'll tell you how, yeah, I'll tell you, I remember it. And then I'm curious to get your like take on what it actually was or the meaning behind it. Yeah. Uh, Mean being the consumer. So essentially I think it was like, it was like 70 bucks a month, let's say. And you got, mm-hmm. um, 
you were you had access to graphics before anybody else so you're able to validate yeah. that kind of consumer demand of like i got it first i can't get you can't get it anywhere else i think they also throw in like a few random like teas and stickers and mm-hmm. um and also, and you got them every single month. And what I took from that, you know, a, a SaaS platform uh, or software as a service or a subscription platform is how mm-hmm. every single business is going nowadays. In fact, you can't even buy Photoshop if you want to. You have to have an Adobe subscription, which is yeah. great for them and terrible for us. But um, what an, a subscription enables you to forecast revenue. Right. And so mm-hmm. I, that that was kind of like where my mind went with it. I'm curious what the reality was on your side. Um, OK, so I think it was called the reserve program. Permanent Sounds reserve, about right. Maybe. Sounds right. OK, so they by the time they got that, there's a lot of logistics to a subscription program, like figuring out margin and shipping. And uh, by the time they got that rolling, I was gone. Mm. Um, I had gotten a job outside the industry with a protein company. A lot of times with my work, I should explain, I'm there to like get things rolling and then the training wheels come off and I don't mean this in a bad way, but they don't need me and they can do yeah. it in house. Your role is to get it started and then you jump off yeah, to get something else started. Did. Yeah. I did that with Ride Channel. I just so happened to get a talk show as well. I did that with Primitive. I did that with Disorder. Mm-hmm. I've done it with, or and sometimes I come in and help people who want help, like uh, I've helped Skate Mental or Zero or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't there when Reserve launched. Like it probably launched another year after I was gone because it takes time. Sure. Um, uh, so I can't speak to um, what you just said about the pre order type stuff, you know, forecasting sales type stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it is true. You can be like, well, we need a minimum. If we're going to do a special graphic that we're not going to make as much margin on from volume, right? Mm-hmm. We need to at least know that <laughs> we don't want to overorder and we don't want to underorder, right? Yeah. So yeah, it is super helpful. The way, but I'm not like a finance guy necessarily. <laughs> the way I look at it is customer acquisition and retention. Like mm-hmm. you, you don't want to just sell a skateboard; you want to acquire a customer. Good point. Right? In, in any case, not right. just in the case of a primitive reserve subscription, you know, and it's funny cause this is like such a, like, this feels like such a like corpo conversation <laughs> to me, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like sales and ROI and margin. But I always look at it as acquiring a customer, not selling a product because with right. e-commerce, you want to keep them coming back and you want to pr- you're providing a service not just a product like whether it's convenience or early releases or um a gift with purchase like there's yeah. an experience and a service you're providing because somebody's coming to you directly rather than going to zoomies or somewhere you know I yeah mean, they can shop where they want uh i'm not arguing uh retail or core shops versus e-commerce what i'm saying is you want to provide something that makes them stoked right and want to come back the same way if you own a restaurant or whatever so my whole thing is i just always tell people you're not selling a board you're acquiring a customer or you're trying to yeah like if you're just out to sell boards like I mean, yeah, you might sell a couple to someone. They might come back. Right. But if they're get if they have that experience of opening a box every month and not knowing what cool free shit's gonna be in there and not feeling like they're part of something, like every skate brand I ever loved was because I don't know, I felt sort of included or that I related, like enjoy. Mm-hmm. Or uh, you know, I just think of the brands I or, or even the pro skaters I looked up to, you know, and yeah. you just don't want to feel such a dis. You don't want to feel so far and unattainable from what you like or admire or are inspired by. And I think an e-commerce experience can be that thing that keeps the kids stoked. It doesn't just have to be like your boards here. It can be like, whoa, even the box is sick 
Or, oh my God, right. they threw in a free sheet of grip. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. when you get an extra chicken nugget at McDonald's, like, <laughs> absolutely. even though it's an accident, you're like stoked, right? Or you get the onion ring in your box of fries. At yeah. Burger King. 100%. Like, I, I just think to me, it's about, um, customer acquisition and retention. Yeah, that's a perfect way to put it. And especially in an industry where the product is so similar, you know, like basically. Yeah, there's nothing. It's paint. Yeah. All the graphic the is the difference. Is paint. Yeah. 100%. Whether I do. it's a t-shirt or a hat or anything, paint is the difference. <laughs> right. So how are you differentiating? And that's where, where marketing comes in. I, I want to dig in mm-hmm. a little bit with you on the content strategy, because for those who mm-hmm. aren't familiar, boy, social media has created tons of challenges for the skateboarding industry from from the demand the vast increase in demand of content and so back in the day it was like we're going to spend four years making a video and then we make that video and we chill for a little bit and then we go back on tour and we start working on a video and four years later another one's going to come out nowadays and and after that video comes out you ride a wave of success for lack of a better term where every kid comes in your shop and buys the board or the wheels or whatever and 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 i wasn't involved back in the day i was at a shop at the time but i wonder what it would be like to be at a company and be like oh how many more weeks is this gonna last (laughs) you know where we have this surge of selling girl boards or Mm -hmm. whatever whatever came from that video yeah um because now it's constant right sorry but go ahead i didn't mean to cut you off i just thought that was an important it is yeah so yeah exactly perfect point so yeah then they've they've got all these sales generating from this the whatever latest company and it's about a year later and then the next company let's say zero puts out their video and they ride that year of success sort of a thing well nowadays and skateboarding is so incredibly demanding on your body more and more Mm -hmm. all the time is uh, skaters are going bigger. They're skating crazier rails. The rails that are skated nowadays weren't even skatable when I was a kid. It was like you didn't even look at that as as something that was possible with like four kinks going all the way down or something. But yeah. now, and I find myself doing this too as a big fan of um, skateboarding videos and someone aware of the the problem. You could say is you watch Yuto Horigami or Naija or Chris Joslin or whoever put their life on the line <laughs> for six months to a year for five minutes of footage. And it's like, cool, next, never watch it again. Rather than previously, it was like, you're buying this VHS tape, I'm watching um, Fully Flared or uh, Yeah Right or whatever the video is like time and time again in Bloom. Actually, Paul's part in Bloom is what I used to watch mm-hmm. every time before I go skate. And um, and so what I saw you guys do at Primitive was finding opportunities to, do, to put out more content in ways that were pretty natural. And so what I observed, I'm curious if you're t- the reality once again, is like when a new graphic came out, Carlos Ribeiro's got like five tricks in there to promote this new series of graphics. And multiple things like that where it was like rather than doing the full-fledged video it was we're doing mini mini parts if you will 30 seconds Mm. a few tricks to promote individual pieces is how it felt to me and that felt really really smart was that what you guys were trying to do or or was that just how i perceived Um, it let me just say this we were thinking digital first. Mm-hmm. That was my mantra. And Heath was the first person to let me sort of spread my wings there. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not saying that was entirely, I'm not saying all these decisions were totally deliberate to reach a, a certain end or perception, right? Yeah. But it was part of the strategy was don't, don't do it the old way and then treat digital second with the old way do it Mm -hmm. digital first and let people consume the media the way they want to right right um and so i think uh the way you perceived it may not have necessarily been the plan 
Mm -hmm. But I think you perceived it as a result of us approaching it as digital first, right? right? Social first. Like we only have 15 seconds on Instagram at the time, right? Right. So why not make it a banger 15 seconds and utilize that space the best you can, not try to send someone to another website to go watch it there. And you know, all that, there's so many old ways of doing things. And, um, to go back to what you were saying more towards the beginning of that question, um, about, you know, you said you watch a video part once now and you never watch it again. And I think there's more to all of that than how many times you watch the video. I think being memorable is important. Like mm. if you see one gnarly trick, there's two things that can happen, right? Or, or, or like I only watched them. Um, what part did I just watch? It was so good, but I don't need to watch it again. I'm, I remember mm. that dude's sick. That part was amazing. He, is awesome right yeah like it's not the same as back in the day things change i don't have the part memorized like i have guy's part and mouse memorized or gino's <laughs> right. part gino's part and mouse uh i mean gino's part and snuff memorized like mm -hmm. i'm just like it's like an instant validation it's like dude rips that board's sick i want to buy it and you, you'll remember that you know what i mean yeah um, it's different now and you have to adapt to that. And, and I've always been a fan. People are always like, don't you miss being in a print magazine? I'm like, no, dude, like mm. I want everyone to consume, you know, that old romantic feeling of like, I love flipping through a magazine and holding <laughs> a book in my hands and having something tangible. Like that's okay. I guess if you really mean it, uh -huh. I think a lot of people just say it, mm. but, um, the idea is I want my work to be read and enjoyed by as many people as possible. And if that means putting an article out on Instagram on 10 slides, mm -hmm. instead of in a blog or on a piece of paper in the one magazine that exists now, Thrasher, like I I'll do that. I'll, I will adapt because to me it's the, the, the medium is just a delivery system. Mm. I want people to read what I'm writing. I don't care how they get it. Right. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, I think to go back to your original question, it's we were just, I don't even think we were like looking to the future <laughs> necessarily. We were just like, what's actually going on and how do we accommodate it? You huh. know, how do we be different? And, and there was the idea of like, how do we push the boundary and change the game a little bit? Like, how do we, you know, I think we approach it like skateboarding. If you think about skateboarding, mm -hmm. the most progressive thing about skateboarding is the pace of the actual tricks and the evolution and everything else. Like, you know, this guy does it down this rail and then this guy does it down a bigger rail and this, right. But everything else is really slow. Mm. The marketing. The, <laughs> yes. Like, so we just treated it like skateboarding. Like, what can we do that's new and cool? Like, how do we adapt to this? platform just like how yeah. do you adapt to a spot like how do you, you don't want to do the same old thing like well there's like I a think that skate sensibility applied to branding or marketing or whatever you want to call it you know yeah i think something that's interesting about skating is there's innovative parts of it <clears throat> and there's <laughs> the opposite of innovative mm -hmm. parts of it or traditional you mm -hmm. could say so you got some people who are uh, shooting VX1000 videos for those in the audience who don't know it's a uh, the sickest looking camera of all time which has a handle on top a big fish eye typically I have a Canon GL1 actually which is like the Canon mm -hmm. version of this of the VX because uh, I couldn't get my hands on a VX when I was 15 um, but and then yeah like the marketing like you're saying more like slower to get there but two things that I would say uh skateboarding innov innovates in is one is influencer marketing i feel like just the way yeah, that vi viral too like viral grassroots marketing and influencer marketing yeah like influencer marketing is relatively new but since i can remember 
Jeremy Ray was my <clears throat> favorite skater growing up. I named a dog <laughs> after him, in fact. <laughs> and my brother's dog was Willie Santos. But, um, <laughs> but, That's so sick. Yeah, but you know, I would wear the shoes that Jeremy Ray skated in. Mm-hmm. I would skate his boards. I would wear his clothes because he was my favorite skater. You know, and mm-hmm. then when he went to a different team, I would wear that stuff. I wasn't team loyal. And so that's kind of like opposite mm-hmm. traditional sports. Uh, what are some of the ways that you see those other innovative ways in skateboarding that we've conquered the world, if you will? Mm. This is an unpopular opinion, but I don't, I think skateboarding sometimes likes to give itself more credit than okay. it deserves. Uh-huh. Um, you know, the like fashion stealing from us, but it's like we were influenced by the fashion world long before the fashion world was influenced by us. Mm. Yeah. Uh, stealing logos, Polo and Tommy <laughs> Hilfiger logos in the early night. I mean, we, it's fine. I'm not trying to be a dick about it. Like I'm a skater. I think we've done great things, but I think right. sometimes we need to like check ourselves and get over it. But yeah, I think to your point, the viral marketing and the influencer marketing. And if I think back to those early days, the only thing comparable was music. Like Mm. when I saw, uh, you know, the way a certain band dressed or, Mm -hmm. you know, I I wanted that, you know, or I at least wanted their t-shirt, you know, Right. And I think music was especially like punk rock and hardcore and like hip hop in the early days. Yeah. That was really underground. You know, those cultures are comparable to skateboarding. And it was like passing around a mixtape or passing around a, even the early rave days, you would just have to like borrow a tape from a friend. It was literally viral marketing. Like, yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I skateboarding, I think skateboarding's biggest influence is how cool it is, right? Like, I don't think we've innovated a ton of things necessarily. Like the boards are the um, same as when I started skating when I was eleven. Yeah, years old. like yeah. yeah, we're in a phase where fashion is. I don't know what's up with the fashion industry. I'm not a fashion industry guy, but yeah, it seems like they're really taking from skateboarding or collaborating with skateboarding or influenced by skateboarding right now. Like which I think is pretty cool, but um, I think like even when I was in Tokyo in the Olympics, right? Like I was at the Olympics and I was seeing videos posted of other athletes, other US athletes Mm -hmm. were like, yo, your guys, skateboarders are so freaking cool. Like Mm. you guys are so cool. Your uniforms are so cool. You guys are so swaggy. Like that was a really interesting perspective as to how different we still are yeah, and how much people think we're the cool guy. Like we're cool, we're unique, we're different, you know? And a lot of the narrative coming out of the Olympics about skateboarding was the camaraderie Mm. and the sportsmanship and, and people don't see like the Japanese girl, competing against the United States girl competing against the Brazil girl and they're all hugging each other. Good afterwards. point. You don't yeah. see that in volleyball or any of the other sports, like right. probably none of them. Um, maybe there's a rare occasion on the field where you see like two athletes, like shake hands or laugh uh, if they're not fighting. And I, I think it's all that nuance of the coolness of skateboarding and that there are these elements where it's more than a sport. It's different than a sport. It's more than competition. I think our influence is more intangible, mm-hmm. like, like those types of things than just worrying about like, did fashion steal this style of pants <laughs> <laughs> that we, that we think we invented, even though we probably didn't. Right. Sure. Um, that's what I think our influence is. I, over the years, have people used skateboarding as a model for perhaps marketing or product development or yeah, uh, style? Yeah, sure. But I think our influence is just how freaking cool skateboarding is, you know? What do you think it is that makes and, skateboarding so cool? Mm. 
it's just one of those things, man. Like, um, I can't relate to a non skater's perception of it. Um, Same. because the minute I saw a skateboard, uh, I was a BMX rider before I skateboarded. Mm-hmm. And the minute I got on a skateboard, I was like, well, this is really fun. I think people, when you ask me that question, are you asking as an outsider, like what makes skateboarding so cool? No, I'm just, I think it's hard for like me to put my finger fun. on it. Okay. Well, it's fun, right? Yeah. Like, and I think even someone who doesn't skate is watching us on the street. Like, even if they think we suck or we're destroying property, mm-hmm. I know deep down there, like that person's having so much fun. Yeah. Like, and I know I get jealous when I see people having fun. Like, not that I'm not capable of having fun, but maybe in that moment, I'm just walking my dog and that's fun, but it's not as fun as that crew of kids over there trying tricks on a curb in a parking lot that that used to be me. And so I look at that and I go, I know how fun that is. Like, I know how much of a core memory that is sitting there yeah. with my friends at a 7-Eleven, finishing our drinks and like, one kid tries a flat ground trick and then the next kid tries it and then it turns into a moment, right? It turns yeah. into a memory. Um, that's what's really special about skateboarding to me. Um, and I've always loved the progression. Like, um, mm-hmm. But yeah, you know, when you say what makes it cool, I think it's always changing too. It's like, it's never people, the tricks change, the, the fashion changes, the as much as we, there are some archaic elements to skateboarding where there needs to be some progression, I think it always looks different and it moves really fast. And it's, it's, uh, it's always fresh and exciting. Like uh, I remember getting mags every month. Just, I wanted to see the ads more than anything. Mm. Like yeah. what's the new ad, new, 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 new trick, new ad, new skater, new pro think about what makes everything exciting in skateboarding. New, 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 new. Good point. New team rider, new shoe. New Everything trick. is like new. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like new spot, new. And so I think it's the freshness of it that that keeps it cool, you know? Yeah, what a lot of people who aren't, in, aren't skateboarders wouldn't know is that every video you see the tricks that pro is doing yeah. are tricks that have never been done on those obstacles before. Yeah. Now, yeah, probably like 50, yeah. Yeah, probably like 70% of a video, you know, there's some lines yeah. and stuff, but everybody's so good. And there's so many good people now, but as far mm-hmm. as like in the pro ranks specifically, mm-hmm. there's a list that people have, I mean, in their minds more than anything, but you know, you're rolling up to the spot with your filmer and he's like, okay, it's already, this rail's been backsmith, back lip, back tail, front blunt, front feeble, front nose grind. Oh, has anybody done a backside over crook? Nope. But you better flip into mm-hmm. it if you want, <laughs> yeah. want your ender. Um, and yeah, it's, it, yeah, that constant progression. And I would add to your, um, you know, what you noted with fun is the ex- exclusivity of it. You know, like, it's one thing that's crazy is like you go to a skate park, most people aren't landing tricks, right? Like mm-hmm. the act of skateboarding is failing. Yeah, it's trial and error. Yeah. Sure. And then there's something, you know, you and I have the skateboarding bug. We've skateboarded for a million years now, but mm-hmm. there's something to some kids fall really hard their first time and they say, I'm not touching that thing again. And some kids fall really hard their first time and they say, I'm getting back on and they can't get enough. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah. it's an interesting dynamic. Yeah. And that's not unique to skateboarding. I mean, I knew kids when I was a little, I was little, I knew kids that were like maniacs. They would like fall on the playground and cut themselves up and not care. And then other kids would fall and cry and go home. Like, yeah, it's whether it's parenting or DNA, uh, like, you know, it's like there's people uh, like John Cardio. Remember, he was like snowboarding, skateboarding, riding dirt bikes, like right. jumping off cliffs. Like even the way he partied back in the day, like all those guys just throwing up in the that kitchen and in the anti hero <laughs> video. Like yeah. everything was gnarly, you know. And sure. some people are just like that. Nigel's like that. 
yeah everything has to be gnarly because the, their baseline for what's gonna get them stoked is different you know right and their threshold for pain or tolerance or fear or whatever it is like yeah it's and you know but i do know people i i have friends and i've known people over the years who are so freaking bad at skateboarding like yeah they can't learn anything these are the people i admire the most actually like i know some people who barely can kick flip after 20 years yeah or barely can and sometimes it's painful it's like god damn like just <laughs> why are you still out, out here <laughs> yeah well, well but that's exactly the most amazing part is that right. they're still out there mm -hmm. me personally this is one of my uh, if there's ever a flaw i have two like things i consider flaws in my love for skateboarding okay. one is i hate skating alone i've done it same actually yeah but i don't like it um yep. but th there's plenty of times in my life where i went out and skated the ledge in front of my house that i had in my garage alone or whatever went to a spot alone or everybody left and i stayed and skated but and the other thing is um like i just said if i wasn't learning tricks mm -hmm. and doing what i perceived as well right um, it was hard for me to enjoy skateboard mm -hmm. uh not in a competitive sense like it's just like i have to learn this back 180 nose grind like right I, there's no way there's only a couple tricks you know when you go through the 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 encyclopedia of like the basic rudimentary tricks like sure that i could never get like and i landed them a couple times with like a back three you know for mm -hmm. example like and yeah eventually you have to move on and be like i can't get that trick but if i could get no tricks <laughs> or only get two tricks like in yeah. my life I would have never and i and i'm insulting myself i would have never stuck with it right and i really admire people who they i i don't want to say suck in a bad way <laughs> like they just what you mean. They, their learning is different and they can't necessarily get a lot of tricks and maybe they're scared maybe there's always going to be a fear of ollieing front side onto a ledge or mm -hmm. maybe their body doesn't allow them to do things a certain way, but I really admire the people who can enjoy skateboarding and stick with it, even if they don't know a lot of tricks or can't do a lot of tricks. Yeah, I've you never know? thought and about it. Just that slap, way. slappying all day long. To me, uh, that's really admirable. I I envy that because I need more to feel fulfilled on a skateboard. I'm the same. I mean, I think it's easy to enjoy what you're good at, and that's it's something honestly as I, i'm 39 years old and so i can still mm -hmm. skate at a pretty high level compared to how i you know on my mm -hmm. scale of things so i can still land some tricks but i've learned to enjoy the feeling of skateboarding much more yeah. as i've gotten older and really cherish those moments more than in the past when it was just like i'm trying to drop hammers and film clips <laughs> yeah I mean, I was never even that good, but as long as I felt like I was progressing and, you know, every day I was, I was advancing every single day. And yeah. that to me was enough. Like, you know what I mean? And some days advancing just meant being on point and landing every trick I know relatively quickly. Other days yeah. it meant a new trick or a new spot, you know? Sure. But yeah, I really admire the people who can skate alone and can can skate no matter how few tricks they know yeah and stick with it uh, i wish i had that yeah there's a lot to admire there i'm mm -hmm. with you well hey I, we uh this hour's gone fast <laughs> yep. and i could talk to you about a lot more but um before i let you go here how can people follow you your writing your content in ways that you would like them to um, the best thing to do is just to follow me on Instagram. I don't, I don't have all the platforms anymore. Yeah. Um, 
you know, and I don't really have a website or anything specific to promote right now. It just, I'm getting started on this book that I've been, what's the word, uh, crying wolf about <laughs> for years and, it, you know, life gets in the way. Sure. Um, but I, I'm really excited and I'll be annoyingly promotional when the time comes and that will yeah. be on Instagram and hopefully on podcasts like yours and places like Jenkum or wherever, wherever anyone will have me. Um, but yeah, and until then I'm just, I, I don't, I don't clamor and claw to create content or be present mm -hmm. all the time. You know, I just, I kind of try to pop up when it's relevant. Maybe once a year I get an article yeah. on monster children or somewhere and I post about it. Or once a year, someone interviews me like you, I post about it. So Instagram's Instagram's the best way until Instagram dies and I have to figure something else out. So you got to move to TikTok. <laughs> um, and when is, <laughs> start dancing. Uh, what is that handle for Instagram? Oh, sorry. It's Robert Brink. Okay, at Robert Brink. Perfect. Yep. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. You took me behind mm -hmm. the scenes of my one of my favorite brands and a lot of incredible skate memories. And I appreciate just having this hour with you to to get to know you better and share your story. So, yeah, thanks for, thanks for um, inviting me on. I always enjoy um, sharing and connecting with people who are doing what I do or or what I did, or you know, they're following that same path that I followed. So it's yeah. cool to uh, talk to you and meet you instead of just on LinkedIn posts. Of course. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you for joining me and thank you to our mm -hmm. audience for tuning in today on the DLC Drop Podcast. Thank you for listening to the DLC Drop Podcast. This podcast is part of the Esports Future I Podcast Network and produced by Innovation Media Enterprises. Make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast channel and leave us a review.